Christmas record for people who can't go there. Well, wasn't that fantastic? Wasn't that a fantastic reading? It was a, it was a little bit long, but that kind of ties in with the video that we saw. So we're just going to have a quick recap from last week. So we saw a man who we now know was 40 years old, we didn't know that before, um, who had been born lame, in other words, he'd never walked before. He was healed by Peter and John at the entrance to the temple. And this man who had never walked, oh, we had this picture of him jumping around and leaping and praising God and running around doing cartwheels and, you know, what these other things that they do and splits and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and of course, there was a crowd gathered because most of the people had seen this man every day. And so they come and, they come and have a look because he's healed in the name of Jesus. Then Peter preaches to the crowds who turn up about Jesus and they all listen to the wonderful message. They can all see this um, ex-lame, this ex-lame man who's just lost his job as a beggar, but you know, he's now become unemployed because he lost his job. And so they listen because they could see the words of Jesus matched up with the power of Jesus. We've always got to have the words and the power of, of the Holy Spirit going together. That's what makes the difference. In other words, all of these people who listened that day were attracted to the truth that Peter talked about, how Jesus could turn a person's life around. And this drew this great big crowd, and people were given serious thought about following Jesus. But this didn't please everybody, did it? As, as we can see. So this is, let's look at verse 1, 2, and 3. It says this, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who believed the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000 people. Now, there have been a few times in the past when I've been out preaching, when I've been interrupted. There was a time in Africa when I was shot at, when I was preaching, I probably wasn't a very good preacher then, so that's why they fired some bullets at me. Um, there's another time when I was in, uh, I think it was in Rwanda, when there was a man walking up and down in front with a big machete staring up at me, which was quite unnerving. Um, and, there's, and there's been all kinds of things over the years. There's been babies crying when you preach and all this different sort of stuff. And, um, but personally, I never get worried about that kind of thing. Maybe I'm a bit thick-skinned. I can just preach. I've, I've got some pastor friends. They have to have quiet they have to have peace. And I've often wondered how they would do out in some, you know, sharing Jesus out in the streets, but, but this is just me. So verse one, the priests and the captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees, came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So they interrupted Peter's sermon. Now, I don't think that Peter spent a great deal of time preparing the sermon on his iPad. I think that he was just speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit, just speaking from the heart. So these religious priests came up to Peter and John because they didn't like the message, because it was all about Jesus. And it's still not a popular message today in some quarters. Many people cannot stand the name of Jesus. And verse 2, it tells us that they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And I just love that word, greatly disturbed. Every time they talked about Jesus and his rising from the dead, it was a reminder of what the religious folks had done to Jesus, of how they, just weeks and weeks beforehand, had condemned Jesus and handed him over to the hateful Romans to be executed, had to be judged, tried, and wrongfully executed. Think about that. Then there was the enormity of the resurrection from the tomb when everybody heard about it. And think about it, there were 16 Roman soldiers who were guarding the tomb. I mean, they were, they were tough guys, but still Jesus rose from the dead. And of course, after that, there had been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus had, had risen from the dead. So there was no doubt that Jesus, who, was, who he said he was, and he had proved that he was a son of God, the hope of the world, he had kept his word because he'd told everybody that he would be uh, crucified and three days later, or on the third day, he would rise from the grave. So everybody knew that. And because of this, the followers of Jesus were beginning to be hated by the religious people of the day. And, and the authorities, they had some power to do this because they controlled so much of, of everyday life at that time. 
So verse 3 says they seized Peter and John and because it was even, they put them into jail until the next day. I guess that Peter didn't and wouldn't stop preaching when he was asked. So he was arrested and thrown into jail, just like that, and, and left there for the night. I don't know what he had planned for his, uh, for his tea that night, but it was going to go cold. So there he was, he was put into prison. So what started with a walk to the prayer meeting at three o'clock that day, do you remember that they were going up to the temple to have a prayer meeting at three o'clock? So what started with a walk at the prayer meeting at three o'clock, which led to a man to be healed, which led to a preach by Peter, now led them to be arrested and thrown into jail for the night. What a church service that would was. I almost feel jealous. You know, it was, it, was, it was quite amazing. All of those things in God's great plan. Now, many people would have been discouraged at this point, upset that, that, that perhaps their carefully crafted sermon hadn't gone too well. But let me say this, God takes whatever we have and he uses it for his glory, whatever words. And God really took hold of Peter and John and the others that day to preach a message in the open air about the risen living Jesus. And verse 4 is just so encouraging as we go through the passage. But many who heard the message believed, so that the number who believed grew to about 5,000 men. Well, 5,000, those are vast numbers, aren't they? They're absolutely huge numbers. But let's not forget that there would have been ladies who would have heard the message as well. So, so let's add another few thousand onto that as the news of Jesus, the living, risen saviour spread. Now, even when they shut the prison doors, I could imagine that the other Christians were outside um, telling others about Jesus. And they say, look, you know, I could just imagine the conversations, you know, people saying, look, you know, look what they've done because they don't like to... Um, let us talk about Jesus, they've now arrested them. Come on, come and hear about this. And I could just imagine that there would have been some, uh, some bravery exhibited that day. And all these people coming to accept Jesus as Lord and Saviour. That's just wow, that's just fantastic. But just imagine that night where Peter and John were spent in prison. I couldn't imagine that the prison would have been too comfortable. I couldn't imagine that they'd have nice reclining chairs or a coffee maker or TV or something like that. It's probably just a bare place, you know, with not much, not much comfort at all. And I wonder what the conversation was. Sometimes I kind of, I kind of wish, I kind of hope that there was more information in God's holy word for us about some of these conversations which we don't hear about. But at the same time, we've got to remember that God's word is God's word and it's there exactly how it is for us. But I wonder what the conversation was. I could have guessed that there would probably have been some forward planning going on to get the story straight for the next day. But let's just imagine for a second how they were feeling. Perhaps they were excited about the lame man being healed. Yeah, absolutely. I guess they'd have been excited about the number of people who were coming to faith in Jesus. I bet they were excited about all the miracles were happening. Every single day there was healings, there was all kinds of things taking place, every single day. And I can imagine that they're excited about that. Or, or perhaps in a moment of doubt, was there a question mark over the whole day? After all, they were in prison and they knew what they, what they had to face the next day. So did they have a few minutes of doubt inside there? Who knows? But I would, I would suggest that they were confident of, of the Jesus that they knew, of the Jesus that they were laying their lives on the line for. So they spent this night there, we don't know whether they got breakfast or who knows whatever, but the next day in verse 5 it says this, the next day the rulers, the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, uh, the high priest, was there and so were Cephas, John, Alexander and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. <coughs> By what power or by what name did you do this? So there they were. There was the good, the bad, the ugly, and those who weren't quite sure, all gathered there in, in, the, in that one place. The whole religious establishment was there, from the high priest and his fam to the elders and teachers of the law, the very people who had plotted and planned against Jesus just, just weeks before and who had handed Jesus over to the Romans to be killed. Think about that. Do you think that it was likely that, that Peter and John thought that they were going to get a fair trial when they got on there. I, I would have bet not. 
I would have thought not. I, I bet they were thinking to themselves, you know, they're not going to listen to us. There's no way are they going to see reason about what we're saying. Verse 7, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power and by what name do you do this? And so Peter, the once fisherman, remember he used to be a fisherman, the Peter who denied Jesus three times in the courtyard on that night, the, the Peter who was restored at that um, breakfast meeting when Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me more than these? He answered the very people that once he had hidden from behind locked doors. He, he had got courage. Uh, and how? We get the clue from verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, and there we have it, he was filled with the power of God, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called into account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and had been asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you today. There was no messing around. Peter was not was in full fisherman mode. He told them straight, I can imagine him looking at each of them in the eye, not coward, not kind of you know, mumbling to himself. I can imagine Peter standing there, full of the power of, of God, standing there, looking at them, he maybe even pointing them. But it was you who killed him. It was you who did this. Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was like, you fella, you lads, you did this. And Peter tells them all that they were wrong and that this, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. That was powerful. And I can imagine that all those religious people were thinking that they were going to be meek little people, not saying anything, but you know, perhaps muttering and stumbling. But they, Peter gave it to them, both barrels. He lays out in truth, the man that you all killed who rose from the dead, is the reason that this man who is standing here, tap dancing in front of you, being healed. Because we also read that the man who was healed was there with them. And I could imagine that he was, he was, quite, you know, he was still quite excited about being able to walk. You know, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if he, if he had given them a little demonstration, you know, maybe done a cartwheel or jumped up and down and, you know, something, and said, look, I, I can walk. And instead of being terrified of of the officials and being tongue-tied peter is bold and fear and fearless and he tells the people who thought that they had the upper hand over them we skip down to verse 12 listen to this some of the most amazing verses in the, in the bible salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved wow these are some of the greatest words ever. There is no other, uh, salvation is found in no one else. There's no other way. There is no other way of getting to heaven. Because Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And he was laying this out here. And Peter tells him, it's only by believing in the name of Jesus that they, they can be saved. He was preaching to the religious establishment of the day. It's fantastic. And, and this was a message that none of them would want to hear but they couldn't deny the power of Jesus working here isn't, isn't that great you know when we you know, when we know what we're talking about you know when we're confident in God and we share the gospel of Jesus people can't help but listen they may not agree with us but what's going to happen is is that they're going to say wow you know there's some authority here and then in verse 13 listen to this when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them there was nothing they could say well listen to this so these two verses 13 and 14 are some of my favorites my entire favorites in in the New Testament well one of well most of its favorite but these but these really stand out for me so first of all we see that uh, Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, and they were astonished. Unschooled, ordinary men. So that's the first thing. First is that they were unschooled men. They had no qualifications to speak or preach or teach. And the religious people often looked down on such as Peter. 
because they weren't part of the team. They didn't have the qualifications. They didn't have the, you know, perhaps the robes, the hat, the other fancy shoes. They looked down on them. And to be honest, sometimes it's still possible for that to happen. There have been times I've been put down um, over the last 38 years as a Christian because I'm not particularly well educated. I, I stutter and stammer often through my sermons. I've got a good day today. I'm speaking okay. You know, yeah, but often, you know, in the past people have said, well, you know, you're just a Norfolk boy. You know, you're just an ex you're a military policeman. You're ex-Friends Foreign Legion. You've done this, you've done that. You know, but some people look down. But they were astonished that Peter knew God's word so well to be able to speak to them so powerfully and but there's something that we can all do study God's word and you will astonish others really get your quotes right when we're when we're sharing to people you know when we're talking about Jesus you know let's just get these things just get these quotes right one of the things I always say you know it's like when people say you know when people say the love of money is is the root of all evil but I'm oh, sorry when I say that money's the root of all evil. You know, you've got to get the scripture right and say, well, actually, the Bible says the love of money is a root of all kind of evil. And because so often people misquote that and they miss, uh, they miss everything. So the second thing is, is this, is that they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And that was the best witness of all. These apostles, they looked like Jesus, they sounded like Jesus, they did miracles like Jesus... They behaved like Jesus. Do you get the drift? Because they had spent time with Jesus, his character had rubbed off in them. And it needs to happen to us as well. That's why I always say about getting into God's word. Get into prayer. Do what Jesus says. Become more like Jesus. Become more like his character. You know, lots of people will, you know, will um, run after the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they're great. But you know, until we get the fruits of the Spirit working in our life, then everything else doesn't, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't quite fall into place. We have to have that kindness, that gentleness. We have to have the fruits. And then when people will look at us, and what do they see? They should be able to see Jesus in some manner or in our conversations with them. And the third thing was, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. They were tongue-tied. They couldn't say, oh, you're making this up. They couldn't say any of those things there. And they couldn't argue because everyone in that room that day, those thousands of years ago, would have seen that man begging. They would have known about him because he'd been there for many, many years. And the scripture tells us that every day he was placed there to beg. So these people would have known about him. They would have perhaps known some of his life story and they'd have passed him every single day. They had no excuse not to believe that what Peter said was true. And even if they didn't believe about Jesus, they could see the evidence, they could see the miracle that had taken place. When this man, who had never walked before, stood up, and as we read in the scriptures last week, his, his feet and ankles got strong. And remember how he talked about how miracles, you know, what a miracle it would have been, you know, with his legs all, all perhaps all wobbly and you're never having stood up with the balance gone, with no strength and no balance, all of these different things. And, and there he was, leaping and jumping and praising God. They had to believe that. They couldn't deny their eyes. But they still really didn't believe. So they did what people still do today. They denied the truth and told Peter and John not to say anything. They warned them, don't say anything else. Stop talking about Jesus. In other words, they tried to put a gag order on, on them. They tried to cancel them out with a, with a few threats thrown in. But as we finish, and we can finish um, as very shortly, then we'll finish with a song. Where are we? Listen to this. Uh, verse 18. They called them in again because, oh, we read that, we put them out. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of going through this quite quick today. Uh, they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, and this, is, and this is something which all of us need to grasp hold of today. If you, if you take nothing else with you today, think about verse 19 and verse 20, because this is something which we can live our lives by. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. But as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Wow. Just imagine if the church in, the, in this nation and as us as Christians can grab hold of this and just say to people 
who tell us not to talk about Jesus, who, who come up with all kinds of things to say to him, well, actually, which is right in God's eyes? Do we listen to you or do we listen to God himself through his word? But as for us, we can't help speaking about what we've seen or heard. That doesn't mean we've got to be rude, nasty, or just be um, too, you're too in people's faces. But what we're seeing here is that no matter what, we have to keep on talking about Jesus, speak truth into power and all these different things, you know, to love people around us, you know, to challenge people gently when they need challenging. Jesus did. Also, we need to pray for people when they need prayer. Even the people that we really don't like. You know, we've probably all got people in our lives that we don't like. I know I have, including one or two family members, you know, sort of in the past. You know, there's people that I work with. Oh, there's one or two. Oh, they, oh, they really get on my nerves, you know, being honest with you. But I pray for them and I share Jesus with them. Like that, you know? And this is what we have to do. Let's really start trying to get into God's word and just, and just have that fragrance of the presence of the Holy Spirit about us when we go, whether it's in work, in school, and all the different things, of, or in your, place, in your place in politics, uh, Becky, all of these different things. And verse 21, that says this, after, after further threats, they let them go. They couldn't decide to punish them because all the people were praising God for what happened. For the man who was miraculously healed had been over over 40 years old. So often we think to ourselves that people don't want to hear the gospel of Jesus, the good news that he, that God left the splendour of heaven, that he came down to earth for us, that he took the form of us, he was fully man, he was fully God, that he did everything that the scripture tells us, that he died, that he truly died, he was in the tomb, on the third day he rose from the grave, defeating death, hell and the grave forever, and that then he ascended into heaven and promising that he was coming back, promising that he was going to send the Holy Spirit, which we did here. And we see the results of it. Praising God, that's the good news which people still need to hear. Now the challenge for us is, um, are we going to take up this challenge? You know, we're smaller in number. Um, there's all kinds of things that you face today as a Christian with all the stuff that's going on. But guess what? That if we become more like Jesus, we will act more like Jesus. And Jesus spoke to everybody without fear or favour in a God-shaped way because he loved them. Amen? Well, we're just going to finish there, there and then we're going to um, I was going to have a last song together. And then if anyone's got any prayer requests or anything, then we can just uh, spend a minute or two praying. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so Lord, I just pray, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that this brief word will just um, impact people's hearts, Lord, and you'll help us to become more and more and more like you, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to have our last, uh, last song together. It's, um, it's a song called Waymaker. Because sometimes, you know, we don't know which way to go, do we? You know, we don't know which way to go. We've got to make decisions. We have to, uh, we have to think about what comes next. Um, all of these different things, you know. But, but when, we, when we commit our lives to the Lord, he promises to make a way where there is no way. Here we go. Oops. <laughs>